Okay, everybody, welcome to the second series of our early season webinar for PestFact Southeastern. I'm Lizzie, and we have Leo and Jess online today as well. We're from CESAR Australia, and CESAR is an independent research company, and we specialise in integrated pest management, biosecurity, and conservation. Now, if you haven't heard of PestFacts before, then they just trying to, here we go. Um, Leo, Jess and I are all involved with the Pest Facts program and we're here to inform growers and, and advisors about invertebrate pests and beneficials uh, during the winter cropping season for crops and pastures. This is part of the IPM for Grains program and we're funded by the GRDC and some of our wonderful research partners. Now today, um, for everybody that's just come on board, we'd love you to introduce yourselves on the chat. We'd like to know who we've got on board today so we can make sure our information is great for you. There's a Zoom poll there as well, which has got a bit to do about what we'll be talking about today. And please use the chat for questions. We'll try and stick to our half an hour for the seminar today, but we will have um, Leo, Jess and myself online afterwards for any questions that you have. And just letting you know that the session's being recorded. So today, Jess is going to be talking about fall armyworm. Um, Leo is going to come on and talk about the red-legged earth mite resistance program that he's working on at the moment. And I'm going to do a really quick call for reports on blue-green aphids. So we'll get started with Jess. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Lizzie. Just checking my audio, you can hear me okay? All right. Um, so we'll get started. Um, if, you, if you sat in last week, um, you would have heard me speak about some native species of armyworm um, that you'll likely be likely to see in southeastern grain crops over winter and spring. Um, so we covered common inland and southern armyworm. There are also a number of species that you'd expect to see in, in warmer weather, like false um, armyworm, beet armyworm, and also now the full armyworm. So usually we wouldn't discuss um, this so early in the year, but given full armyworm is a new species to Australia, we're going to um, share as much information as, you, as we can with you on this species throughout 2021. So uh, full armyworm has become pretty well known for its very fast spread uh, to new regions around the globe um, in a very short time frame. So that's since 2016 in particular. Um, it spread to countries that are highly reliant on, on maize um, and also sorghum and rice. So it's caused some significant issues overseas. In early 2020, uh, it was detected in the Torres Strait. And throughout last year, as many of you, I'm sure, would have seen in the, in the news and through other channels, it spread through um, WA, uh, Queensland and, and parts of New South Wales as well. So maize is highly preferred for this species as a host, um, but it's quite prolific. Um, so it's also, it will also feed on a wide range of species from the grass family. So that includes sorghum, sugar and rice. Um, and its preference for many of our pasture, pasture grass species in Australia is, is yet to be determined. So looking at the life cycle, um, you can see I've put a, a nice diagram in from Cabby here. It's a noctuid moth that um, develops very, very quickly and it can actually develop from egg to adult um, within a month um, under optimal conditions. Um, and optimal conditions for this moth is around 23 to, to 30 degrees uh, Celsius. So I'm just using a maze as an example um, when I describe its life cycle here. Um, so the eggs uh, are, are laid in clusters and often they're laid in clusters on the underside of, of the lower leaves. And then you get early in star, very small grubs feeding on the leaves. And at this stage, because they're very small, um, they'll often cause a windowing type of damage. Um, I'll just bring up a couple of photos here. During the day, they can also um, drop to the ground. So they'll feed on the, on the foliage at night and then they'll drop to the ground during the day. And, and at that stage, they can actually continue to feed at the on the base of the plant as well and cause damage that way. Um, as they uh, mature, as the grubs grow, grow bigger and, and older, they can become actually more cryptic in their feeding habits. And, and at that stage, 
they can start burrowing into the wall of the um, of the maize um, or the plant that it's feeding on, um, or, or the cob um, in, in the case of, of maize. Um, and at that stage, they can become difficult to um, to find, um, but also to to manage. So in terms of targeting particular growth stages of plant um, for, for egg lay and feeding, they're quite indiscriminate, um, at least from what we know, um, but the preference for plant parts can actually change. So if it's feeding on a young maize plant, um, the leaf wall is, is quite attractive um, on young plants, um, but if they're feeding on an older plant, the cob silks can be quite attractive. So you end up getting feeding and damage on a, on a wide range of plant parts, as you can see here. In terms of how likely um, it is to establish in southeastern Australia, uh, host availability certainly does play a role. And there are plenty of hosts avail available to it in, in the southeast, as you can see from this host map here on the right. Um, but climate and weather patterns are also very, very important. Um, so these images here display times of year when fall armyworm is likely to um, survive and develop based on some recent prediction work. So it's been predicted that it, it will establish in some parts of Australia, like Northern Australia, and establish permanent year-round populations in these parts. But for more Southern regions, like the Mallee, <clears throat> the Riverina, or, or Victoria's high rainfall region, we're more likely to see migratory populations occurring from around October to November, and then population build up throughout summer and, and early autumn. So these are a couple of map figures taken from a 1987 paper that explored the migratory mechanisms of noctuid moth species um, in Australia. So fall armyworms are noctuid moth um, species. The graph on the left um, shows the possible migratory pattern of a species that is cold tolerant and can use diapause as a survival mechanism in cold conditions. So southern armyworm is an example of this. I mentioned last week that it can stay um, in Victoria, for example, where it's a little bit cooler throughout the winter months and slow its development um, during that time and essentially diapause through. So it doesn't need to move to a warmer climate each year to survive. But on the right is the kind of pattern you would expect from full armyworm, um, which has an annual um, immigration to the south and then uh, emigration to the north instead of overwintering and diapausing like a, a species um, like southern armyworm. So um, I mentioned last week in, related, in relation to native species of armyworm, and this is a case for full armyworm as well, weather conditions that support long range migration will be a big influencer in terms of an annual immigration um, down south. Uh, last December, we um, set up a pilot trapping program um, in Northern and Central Victoria. And we did this for a couple of reasons. Um, firstly, to keep a, a lookout for any fall armyworm uh, migration, but also to assess the type of bycatch growers and advisors might um, expect to trap um, when monitoring for fall armyworm using a couple of different lure types. So we ran the trapping program from December to um, throughout part of January. Um, and we put two traps in um, maize crops at five different locations um, at Lockington, Corrup, Kyabrum, Katapna and, and Shepparton. And we used two different kinds of lures, uh, the Kemtika lure and a Trichy lure, and we placed them in bucket traps. So you can see by this table at the bottom, the lures just, um, they differ by uh, one chemical compound um, there. So in terms of the trapping pilot results, um, similar to what's been found up north, um, Lucania laurii, a false army worm, was a very common um, frequent lepidoptera that was found in these traps um, at all of the sites that we, that we trapped at. Um, this does tell us that when you're trapping for full armyworm using these lures, um, sorting full armyworm from other moth species that might look similar when okay. assessing trap catch will be really important. Um, we also trapped um, other species like wasps and bees, leafhoppers, some beetles, rather glen bug, and a few types of other um, species in the bycatch. Um, they're less of a concern because they can easily be sorted out when you're when you're sorted, sorting through your bucket traps. So we also detected one male full army worm in northern Victoria at the Katupna site. Um, and this detection came after 
two sightings in Victoria, which were both made in East Gippsland. You can see by the red pins down the bottom there. So this was the first sighting in Northern Vic. Now it is possible, um, keeping in mind um, what I mentioned about weather patterns being important to support long range migration of this species, as it is for native armyworms, that these detections were the result of one migratory surge, perhaps in um, December of last year. Okay, um, so when we talk about um, considerations for trapping, I'll, I'll just mention that um, out of the trapping with work that we've been doing, we'll be developing a guide for um, to help you with summer trapping. So a guide that will talk about lures that you can use and where to place the traps, what kind of traps to use. Um, so for instance, you can use bucket traps like we have been using. And in this case, if you use them, color is important. So the green, yellow and white bucket traps are, are preferred um, by these moths. But there's also some um, information, some scientific studies that show that the Heliothus or Helicoverpa sentry traps might provide some greater sensitivity than bucket traps. Um, if you're using the sentry traps, height of the trap becomes very important. So we'll be placing that in a guide for you to guide um, trapping for um, leading into next season. We would suggest um, in terms of what we know and predict about the movement of this particular species into southeastern Australia, that you look to start trapping um, from November um, through until harvest. Um, of course, the trapping of the adult moths is, it's a good indication of when those seasonal surges are happening, but it's not a good indication of egg and larval load um, in the crop itself. So they simply serve as an indication as to when you should get out in the crop um, and undertake some, some monitoring for larvae um, to, uh, to find out if you have um, damage um, and if you have uh, a load um, of larvae that would merit um, action, management action. So when you're monitoring, um, if, um, if you do get into a situation um, later this year where you are monitoring for full armyworm, becoming familiar with the feeding damage is pretty important. So as I said, they're quite indiscriminate as to when um, what growth stages of plant they target. So you can get feeding damage on a young plant or an old plant that look a little different and the feeding damage can look different based on the growth stage of the grub as well. So becoming familiar with that damage um, is, is very useful. Um, overseas, they've produced some really good guides on the type of damage you can expect. Um, and um, a, lot of, a lot of the times in full armyworm research, they use this damage scale called a Davis scale to look at the kind of damage and extent of damage that the species is doing. Um, there has been a full armyworm continuity plan that was released uh, late last year and it's hosted by Plant Health Australia. This plan is, is uh, it's good, it's very practical um, and um, there should be a link that you can see in the chat box there. Um, it, it includes some really good um, guidelines on how to monitor in the crop um, using a standardised technique that will then allow you to make uh, an assessment based on the available thresholds. Um, at the moment, the thresholds that we're using are based on USA thresholds. So there's still some work to be done determining thresholds in Australia. And those thresholds um, vary by the crop stage and also the type of crop, um, as you would imagine. So in a similar way to Russian wheat aphid, as, as many of you might know, we were using the, the um, US threshold um, for Russian wheat aphid for three or four years after um, the pest was found um, in Australia until research was able to um, um, determine what thresholds would be um, regionally relevant for Australian regions, um, which has now been done. So adult and larval morphology, getting your head around that is also important for monitoring. This is a, um, this is a species that can be a little bit difficult to ID out in the field until you really get your eye in. Uh, so we have, um, we have a few um, species around that time of year um, in the warmer weather that you might find um, in crops that fall armyworm that will target. That would include the corn earworm, um, false armyworm, and also beet armyworm. Um, I've got a few um, different um, species here on the page. And what I might do is give you all about 20 seconds um, to place in the chat box um, which ones you think are a full armyworm. Start the countdown now. Let's see if I can bring up the chat box. <laughs> so can, there is a, I can man the there chat. are a couple. Sorry, Lizzie. I can man the chat for you if you like. 
Yeah. Yeses. There's a couple in there that are full army worm, no takers yet. Um, but I'll click through and I'll show you which ones are in fact. We've got to guess yeah. and maybe A. Yeah, Chris got it. A is a, um, an adult full army worm and E is obviously the larvae. And then uh, we've got false army worm, cornea worm, and beet army worm. So colour is not a good guide when it comes particularly to caterpillars, color can change based on what they're feeding on. Um, but there are some little key morphological features that you can use um, to help you um, determine whether um, it is full armyworm or not, or at least give you a good indication, um, such as these white patches on the wings of full armyworm, the four wings. Um, we don't have time to go in in detail today about um, morphology, but perhaps that's a, that's a segment that we can bump to a, a later um, webinar or put in a, a, a future Pest Facts article to give everyone a good grounding in that. So I'm just going to finish um, because I'm running out of time with a snapshot of some ongoing work on full armyworm you can expect to hear about during the year. There is a fair bit of work being undertaken by two separate projects um, led by New South Wales DPI and CSIRO respectively um, on current permitted um, pesticides against full army women in Australia and how um, efficacious these chemistries are and if there are cases of resistance. Um, there's also a horticulture funded investigation on natural enemies being led by QDAF. Um, so there's likely to be some good flow on knowledge to the grains industry from that project. Um, and since um, full army worms arrival, QDAF have been working to gain approval to import and trial the biopesticide uh, Forligen, which some of you might have heard of. Um, they gained approval for that this year. So they'll be um, looking at um, testing out Forligen um, during, during the year. Um, and there's been recently quite a good podcast series released as a cross collaboration between um, plant RDCs that I recommend you check out if you're interested and you should see a link to that coming up in the chat. So lastly, just on the topic of, of resistance briefly. Um, so CSIRO, as I said, has been doing some work um, testing, um, specifically focusing on whether we have populations that are resistant to certain chemicals in the country. Um, and they've been looking at populations at Queensland and WA. And what they've found is there is variability in sensitivity to certain chemical groups across all of those populations. Um, and this work is ongoing, but as an early result, both New South Wales and DPI and, and CSIRO have shown independently that Australian populations of full armyworm are considerably less sensitive to synthetic pyrethroids in comparison to um, Helicoverpa armidra, which has been used as a, as a control species, um, if you will. Um, so that's, um, that's an Im important finding and certainly is going to be a finding that, um, that influences how we, how we manage um, this species going forward. Um, and in this instance, metabolic resistance is, is suspected to be the case. Um, in addition, um, the study has found a tolerance to endoxicarb um, has, is also um, evident across populations. So it's ongoing work, um, but this work is providing us with a good solid basis for developing um, resistance management strategies for full armyworm, which is going to be really, really important. Um, it's a pest that is, is known to develop resistance um, very well, um, and, and this has been shown across the globe. So as with any new species in the country, the research does take time, but I'll just leave, uh, leave you with a uh, watch this space um, comment. And um, when we um, receive further results about full armyworm and, and have new information for you, we'll certainly be passing that on. So that takes me to the end of full armyworm and I'm going to give um, control of the presentation to Leo McGrain now. Um, he's gonna take you through uh, red-legged earth mite. And we do have a question from Chris. Chris, we'll come back to your question at the end of the session. And anybody else, feel free to write your questions into the chat. Unmute. Oh, that's stuff. I, I couldn't unmute myself because I had the remote control. Um, OK, thanks, everyone, um, for joining today. So I'm just going to run through some of the uh, resistance research that's gone on previously and that uh, we're currently undertaking on red-legged earth mite. And then at the end, I will run through a mite identification refresher, just so you're on the lookout for what mites you might see uh, this winter season in your crops. So, if I... okay. 
So red-legged earth mite, as, as everyone knows, is a pest of winter grains and pastures. And it can be particularly damaging at crop establishment. Uh, it tends to feed on the upper surface, surfaces of leaves and it can feed in aggregations of up to 30 individuals um, at, at any one time in, in one area of the leaf. It, is, um, it attacks quite a wide range of broadleaf crops and pastures like canola, wheat, oats, barley, lucerne, vetch, and, and some pasture legumes uh, and broadleaf weeds, uh, among others. And uh, red-legged earth mite are generally active from uh, late spring to, sorry, from, from autumn to late spring in Southern Australia. And they often occur alongside other mite species like Balestia mite, Blue Oat mite, Bryobia mites, and Brown Wheat mite. And I will go through some of the distinguishing features of each of those mites later on. So red-legged earth mite, as I mentioned, um, is present during the, the winter season. Eggs, summer eggs hatch um, in autumn and they, they hatch uh, when temperatures uh, cool and after adequate rainfall. If red-legged earth mite are present in, in, in high numbers around crop establishment in June and July, they can actually cause quite significant damage to establishing crops. They, they can go through three generations um, each season. And in the springtime with the, the onset of warmer temperatures and, and drier soils, um, they produce oversummering diapause eggs. Now these eggs will remain on the soil after females die and they're protected over the summer months from heat and desiccation. And unfortunately, uh, insecticides and miticides don't control oversummering eggs. Just a bit slow there. Oh, that's better. And the story of red-legged earth mite control, I suppose, is, is one of, of um, few, few chemicals that are actually quite available for control. So red-legged earth mites, the control of them is heavily reliant on insecticides uh, through foliar uh, insecticides and through seed treatments. There are five mode of actions that are actually registered for control of red-legged earth mite at present. They include synthetic pyrethroids, organophosphates, fiproles, um, diaphenturion and neonicotinoids. And of these um, mode of action groups, synthetic pyrethroids, organophosphates and neonicotinoids are quite heavily relied upon. Um, the former two being foliar sprays and neonicotinoids being a seed dressing. Um, and, and as a result of this sort of high selection pressure from, from these insecticides, it has resulted in resistance to organophosphates and synthetic pyrethroids being present now in um, large areas of Western Australia and in Southern Australia and in Victoria. So I'll just move on to surveillance and some story about resistance. Resistance in um, synthetic pyrethroids in red-legged earth mite was first discovered in Western Australia in 2006. And uh, organophosphate resistance was then discovered in Western Australia in 2014. Uh, shortly after this, it was discovered uh, both of resistance to both of these chemicals was discovered in South Australia. And most recently in 2018, low levels of organophosphate resistance has been discovered in Victoria. Um, the majority of this spread of resistance, this evolution of resistance, um, is actually from independent evolution um, of insecticide resistance as a result of high selection pressure from insecticide usage uh, across the southern uh, grains region. There has been some small evidence of um, dispersal uh, of resistance through diapause eggs, through either uh, wind or on machinery or through the transport of fodder, but most of the spread of resistance is through independent evolution events. Now, since the first detection of synthetic uh, pyrethroid resistance in Western Australia in 2006. Um, there has been surveillance gone on for the last 13 or 14 years with uh, through different, various different GRDC investments. And over this time, um, there has been a total of 1,029 different populations of red-legged earth mites screened for resistance. Of these populations, it has been found that 195 of them have exhibited resistance to synthetic pyrethroids uh, 59 of them have exhibited resistance to organophosphates, 
and 24 actually exhibit resistance to both organophosphates and um, synthetic pyrethroids. So over the years, uh, th this resistance has actually covered uh, quite a, a large range of the known distribution of red-legged earth mites in Australia. And more recently, it is um, resistance surveillance has improved through the development of uh, high throughput molecular um, diagnostic for synthetic pyrethroids in um, red-legged earth mite, and also with the with the development of predictive modeling. Um, more recently, predictive modeling has helped uh, model climatic data, um, chemical usage data, and also some um, resistance data from old databases. And this enabled us to determine at-risk areas to um, guide our surveillance. And, and through this, uh, these at-risk areas, we actually discovered um, resistant populations of red-legged earth mite that may not have been discovered otherwise. So there's there's definitely some new powerful tools that um, are really going to help with this uh, red-legged earth mite surveillance going forward. So I'll just run through some of the current management recommendations that there are at present for um, managing resistance in this pest, and then I'll run through some of the um, new research that we're going to be undertaking. So. A national resistance management strategy has been established for red-legged earth mite um, in response to these resistance issues, and it recommends a range of cultural and chemical control options to reduce selection pressure um, from the same chemical group across successive generations of mites. Um, so some of these recommendations are, are um, things that you will be quite familiar with. They uh, include avoiding unnecessary spraying, rotating between mode of action groups, and, and controlling weeds along fence lines and, and before sowing. Now this resistance management strategy is, um, hasn't been updated since 2018. So more recently there has actually been a best management practice guide that has been developed um, through another GRDC investment. And, and this guide is um, a lot more detailed in terms of red-legged earth mite management and trying to minimize the evolution of resistance. It provides some detailed information on um, red leg identification, their life cycle, it assesses paddock risk, and then it, it gives some seasonal considerations um, for minimizing um, the incidence of red legs in your paddock. Um, so I'll just take you through how it works real quickly because it's quite a useful guide if you haven't seen it already. Um, so essentially it, it, it uses a risk matrix to determine management throughout the year. Now you're faced with two scenarios. This is one of the scenarios, which was uh, the previous year your paddock was in pasture or fallow. And the other scenario is that the previous year your paddock was um, under cropping. You, you essentially just run through all of these questions and, and tick the appropriate box, which, which will give you a, a weighting, a score. So for example, if last um, year's paddock was in pasture and it was perennial or annual grass dominant, uh, you, you'll put a tick beside that and you'll get a weighting of two. Um, whereas if it was legume dominant, you get, sorry, uh, you get a weighting of minus two. And if it was legume dominant, you get a weighting of two. So you work your way through this matrix and you will come up with a score. And this score will either be a, a, a low risk rating, a medium risk rating, or a high risk rating. And with that risk rating, it's hard to say risk rating, <laughs> um, it, you will be presented with four different um, key management time points throughout the year. This is late spring, pre-sowing, uh, seedling establishment, and winter spring period. And based on the risk rating that you um, achieve from the matrix, it gives you a recommendation of what you should do. So for example, in late spring, if you had a low risk, you do not need to um, use a time right spray. Whereas if you had a high risk, it's recommended that a time right spray or strategy uh, be implemented and that you, you, you graze the paddock quite tight uh, in the springtime to minimize the incidence of uh, red legs the following um, autumn when eggs will be hatching. So this is a really, really useful guide and I definitely recommend if you haven't seen it already that you, you take a look at it. Um, so I'll just run through quite quickly some of the uh, future research that is being undertaken at the minute. So a new four-year uh, GRDC investment that um, for red legs uh, has on, begun um, late last year, and it aims to manage uh, resistance in this pest. Uh, it's led by CSER and it's in collaboration with University of Melbourne and DPIRD. And the 
valuable surveillance that has gone on for the last 14 years will continue with um, during this project. Uh, this will be helped by the molecular diagnostic I mentioned earlier on and also predictive modeling. Uh, we're also going to look at new chemical and biological um, options uh, to control red legged earth mite, um, including uh, the assessment of what predators are available, available for this uh, mite species, um, such as the French Anistis predatory mite. And we're also going to be exploring some, some field trials to look at alternative management practices for controlling red legs. So if, if any growers or advisors um, are on today and, and they've had success in, in the past controlling red legs uh, through alternative means, we, we really encourage you to reach out to us and we'd like to chat to you and, and actually get your input um, to help us develop these trials over the next three years. Um, and yeah, just uh, one last point I'd like to um, point out is that if you have experienced a, a control failure or you suspect you might have some red leg resistance in your paddock and you want to get a, a, a sample uh, tested for resistance, that is a service that is offered through this investment and we encourage you to get in touch. Uh, you can contact Dr. Aston Arthur on the number provided here or her email address is aarthur at caesaraustralia.com. Um, so I'll just quite quickly now run through a, a, a mite identification refresher. Um, so red legs, as most of you know, um, they are, are distinguished by their black velvet body. They also have eight um, orange red legs and they're one millimeter in size. Um, and that's really the, the main feature of them is their, their black velvety body compared to the other mites. You might see them alongside. Um, they tend to feed uh, in groups, as I mentioned earlier on, and they cause silvering uh, of the leaf surface, uh, which can be reminiscent of frost damage. In comparison, the blue oat mite, although it is the same size as red legged earth mite, it's, it's quite different in that it has a shiny blue black body and a distinctive red mark on the lower portion of its back. Hopefully you can see that mark in this image. It's, it's a little bit dark, but it's got a red mark on its lower back and unlike red legs, they tend to feed, um, usually not feed in groups, and they also cause a silvering of the leaf surface. Blastium mite, on the other hand, are, 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 are much bigger than, well, much bigger isn't a, a true statement. They're bigger than red legs and blue oat mites. They're around two millimeters in size. They have a dome-shaped body uh, with, with white stout hairs, and they're a red-brown color. And it, it might be hard to see uh, with the naked eye, but if you see them under the microscope, they have distinctive foot pads on the ends of each of their legs. As you can see here, the, the white covering of their body and the, the dome shape. And they tend to feed on the outer surfaces of uh, the edges of leaves that you can see some damage done to some lupins here. Uh, Barobia mites um, are another species you might encounter. There's at least seven different species um, of this mite in Australia. They're smaller than the other mites I've spoken about previously at about 0.75 millimeters in size. They have an oval shaped flattened body and they can often be um, characterized as, as looking pie shaped. Um, and quite distinctively, their, their front pair of legs are, are quite long and you'll notice them moving up and down as they uh, scurry across whatever the, the, um, plants you might find them on. And they, again, leave a silver feeding trail on leaves. And lastly, uh, you might come across brown wheat mite. And these are quite similar to bryobia mite. They're a little bit smaller, um, at 0.6 millimeters. But again, they have a um, distinctively long pair of front legs. Their body, unlike um, bryobia mites, is more globular in shape and they are a dark orange uh, brown color. Damage can look like water stress on plants, and if they're in high enough numbers, they can cause a mottled discoloration, and it can often um, look give a scorched appearance in sort of heavy infestations. So I think that's the end there now. Thanks very much, everyone, for listening in. And I'll just pass over to Lizzie. Thanks so much, Leo. Um, if we can just go back one slide, Jess. Um, so while we're talking about insecticide resistance, I just wanted to alert people to the fact that with the blue-green aphid, there has been reports of control failure across some of the southeastern cropping regions. And this is when after a farmer has, um, has attempted to control this um, pest and they've actually come back again. And so this is an early indicator that they may be 
um, developing an insecticide resistance, although there are other reasons why the pest could come back as well. So it's important to investigate these kind of instances. The ways that we can prevent um, the, the rise of insecticide resistance, as Leo said, are to only spray if really necessary, to rotate, rotate between different chemical groups and to avoid the broad, broad spectrum sprays on a routine. So um, CESA and um, CSIRO are actually working to track the chemical sensitivity of this pest, and they want to develop some long-term control measures to avoid the rise of insecticide resistance in the future. So we really do encourage anybody that's seen any evidence of control failures for blue-green aphid to report them to us. Um, and the way that you can report for uh, any kind of um, pest sighting or um, control failures with us is on the next slide for us. Uh, you can get in contact with us at PestFax um, through either that the number that's on the screen there, you can email us or you can send a report through Twitter as well. And hopefully you're already signed up to our um, newsletter so that you can hear all the updates that are coming through. Um, this is the end of the formal um, information that we wanted to give to you today, but we do have a question in the chat that we will come back to and we do encourage anybody else to stay online if you do have extra questions that you wanted to ask. Jess, if you're able to, can we go back to that question that Chris had earlier about mm -hmm. the feeding of um, the full army worm? Yeah, I'll read it out. Um, any advance on very specific maize corn as a preferred plant host? Um, Melina Miles previously outlined very specific feeding and ignoring nil impact um, on neighbouring mung bean, wheat, etc. Um, there is certainly a very high preference um, for maize, um, quite high. Um, so um, I, I can say that um, in terms of varieties of maize, there, there certainly have been research studies overseas showing that um, depending on the variety of maize, it can vary in terms of the, the impact on the maize itself. Um, but in terms of what studies, uh, what research um, or insights have been found in Australia so far, particularly in the um, northern region um, where they're dealing with full armyworm um, across the year, I'm, I'm happy to take that question on notice and perhaps send out an answer via email to, to the attendees or address it at, um, in next week's webinar. Thanks so much, Jess. If anybody else has any questions, you're welcome to either unmute yourself or to write it into the chat. I will end the poll now. Thank you for everybody that responded in the poll. Looks like quite a few people haven't heard of the insecticide resistance strategy. Um, so I did post a link to it in the chat, but also if you would like any more information on this, then just get in contact with us. We'd be more than happy to chat about it and the kind of resources that are available. Of course, if there are any other pests that you're having trouble with as well, um, we do have quite a lot of resources through our website um, and through the other work that we do. So we're always happy to have a chat. Lizzie, Chris here. Hi, Chris. Hello. Um, look, thanks, thanks for today. That's been really good. Um, I guess from Victorian government, so AgVic perspective, we have been seeing, I guess, uh, two instances where um, confirmed detections of fall armyworm have been ones in a seed crop uh, in, in Orbost. And uh, that was a great example of industry actually preemptively doing their own surveillance, which, which was awesome, those Gippsland seeds. Uh, but seeing it in, in grazing or fodder maize in, um, in Northern Victoria is, I guess, a, a worry for, for us only in that, I, like I, I note that GRDC are strong in, in, in following up fall armyworm um, probably more in the seed production space. And I'm just not sure who's, who's the go-to for, if you like, people who are, who are banking on the, the fodder or the, the foliar feed for that and whether there's uh, strategies for that. Because I, I guess the risk is that when we do get to um, economic thresholds, it might be for, for seed rather than fodder. I'm just wondering if, there's, if that coverage is, is there. And I think it's the dairy industry that's probably most interested in that. Mm. Do you mean go to Chris in terms of um, go to for sharing information in that industry or, or learning? And, yeah, or or, yeah. Or, do, or doing that work. I'm I'm not sure who who may yeah. be a, a a natural lead in that, and I'm not engaged enough with across the the partnerships that you have. Well, it's it's probably a real a, a well timed question, Chris, because I'm about to jump on to a mm. um, cross industry full army worm meeting after this, where I can ask yep. that question for awesome. you. Awesome. <laughs>
No, that's that's good. And Kyla from my team will also be speaking at that. But mm. um, yeah, anyway, look, I, I think there's there's you know JRDC have been strong, and I'm just looking at, at where else um, um, that sort of coverage comes. I, I end up speaking to some of this from an AgVic perspective with the media, and um, it, it seems to be that apart from the thresholds being US based at this stage, um, we don't have a lot more to go on. But it's a it's a developing story here, and mm. um, yeah, I'll be looking forward to it. Thank you for holding this, and I'll be here next week. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, we're lucky in that um, at least um, the PestFact subscribership, we do have some um, overlap with um, forage-based, partial-based industries. So hopefully that's one mechanism that we can use to get some information out across industries as well. Okay, thank you very much. We haven't had any other questions come up in the chat, but as I said, we're always available through the PestFact phone or the email address. Um, thank you very much for everybody that joined us today and hopefully you're able to join us again for next week.